All righty. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our, our event today, the Cockroach Hour. Um, today, we're going to talk about, uh, we, have, we have a special guest from Red Hat joining us. So we're going to talk about OpenShift. We're going to talk about containers. We're going to talk about Kubernetes, all this goodness. And I'm going to presume we're going to end up talking a little bit about open source, too, after meeting our, uh, our presenter here. So, um, But let me just give a little quick uh, guidance before we get started here. Uh, you know, we do have a QA panel. There is a chat panel as well. Um, please engage however you like. Uh, you know, we enjoy questions on, on the Cockroach Hour. Um, you know, Tim Vale is joining me again if you're a repeat customer. Um, and I know Tim manages a lot of the chat going on. And members of our team are actually in the chat. So we've had a couple sessions with some really, really um, lively uh, chat going on in the background. Uh, we'll be monitoring it, looking for questions along the way. Uh, so not a typical webinar where we present a bunch of slides and come back. Uh, we'll, we'll be trying to do these things um, all the time. So, uh, and, and then finally, I, and actually there's the first question, will a recording be available? Absolutely. So uh, we will make the recording available. Uh, typically Dan on the team gets it up there within an hour or two uh, onto the Cockroach Labs uh, YouTube channel, uh, but we'll send it out to everybody as well. So, um, so with that, thank you all for joining. Uh, and uh, today's session is, uh, you know, we've been asked before, like, can you tell if these things are basic, intermediate, or advanced? You know, I think of this session as more of a basic uh, conversation. Uh, we're not going to get into some any command line. We're not going to get too deep into distributed transactions like we've had in the past. Um, this is a little bit more kind of higher level stuff, workloads, Kubernetes, definitions of these things, uh, where people are getting tripped up on these things, uh, and, 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 and talking through those sort of things, right? And so, um, but please do ask questions. We will send mugs out to people. I have a mug around here somewhere. I'd, I'd model it. But uh, so with that, let's uh, let's bring the cameras on. So uh, Tim and Scott, if you guys want to join me, there you are, Tim, and then Scott. See, so hey, everybody, in the, everybody in the crowd, it's uh, it's 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 guys Flan with brain hair and uh, flannel shirts today. That's flannel that's shirt Wednesday. Sorry. Our diversity is really low, and I'm sorry, everybody. I will endeavor to get better. This one in particular, sorry. Um, but I, I, I promise that the conversation will be lively, uh, and and um, you know we'll keep it to some really interesting topics here. But um, you know, first and foremost, uh, thank you, Scott, for joining us. Um, Scott McCarty is a principal product manager uh, in charge of containers at Red Hat. So. Um, Scott, what do you work on at, at Red Hat? Uh, you know, I mean, that's uh, I give you I, a title is like what four words. Uh, yeah. What what do you what are you working on at, at Red Hat? But, but it's all about the syllables. Like if you're a right. principal product manager, that's like what seven eight syllables. That's and then you throw better. containers in. There's another another couple there. Yeah, another three syllables. You're good to go. Yeah, I, I was I used to have a title that was sixteen syllables. I thought that was way cooler, but I used to make fun of myself much more. Um, so in this role, I. Uh, I live in what's called, so, so, so there's two main platforms at Red Hat, if you will, like, you know, there's OpenShift and there's RHEL, and I live in sort of this nexus yeah. in between the two where, where my team, our team builds um, technology like uh, Cryo, Podman, Builda, Scopio, we work on Run C, we work on like all these low level bits. Um, I also manage the roadmap for Red Hat Universal Base Image. So sort of all these primitives is what I call them. They're like the right. basic flour, sugar, eggs, and water of containers that we basically build for Red Hat. I should have worn my rocket t-shirt today, um, knowing knowing that what you work on. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that though, if anybody does. Yeah, we consider we consider Podman the sort of spiritual successor of rocket. So it I is, it is, it is. But I know, but the little rocket logo was so great and everything. Um, Scott, how long were you at, uh, how long have you been at Red Hat? I have been at Red Hat nine years. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, yeah, it's amazing it's when long. I meet Red Hat half. employees. So, you know, you, there's the tenure is long. I've met, I've met people, you know, dozen, well, over a dozen years. What is, I guess Red Hat's been around for how long? 20 years now? It's. We had on our company call today, uh, Mike Evans passed 25 years. So we've been around since what, not, you know, over yeah. 25 years. I don't okay. remember the start date, 93, I want to say. Yeah. 93 was the start date. So I guess I can finally say like, there's some people who have been there a couple dozen years. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, to me, you know, one of the most important companies of my generation and all of our generations in terms of, you know, I think all three of us here are um, open source advocates and zealots and all, all of us. I, you know, I don't have a neck beard, but I definitely love open source. So, um, so, so thanks. Thank you, Scott, for joining us. And then yeah. Tim Vale, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? 
Well, hey, everybody. Uh, Tim Vale here, head of uh, solutions engineering at Cockroach Labs, been here about two and a half years. And as Jim mentioned, spent a lot of time in, in open source prior to that. So glad to be here, glad to be talking about all this fun stuff. And, and Tim brings in an angle of, you know, uh, engagement with customers every day, um, you know, both large and small, you know, smaller companies using Cockroach Cloud, uh, larger companies trying to deploy, uh, you know, CockroachDB on Kubernetes or, you know, in these kind of distributed environments, um, you know, in a single cloud, multi-cloud, uh, lots of different things. We're going to talk about hopefully all those things uh, today. Um, my name is Jim Walker. I am uh, I, I, I'm in product marketing here at Cockroach Labs. I am just a week short of two years at this company. So, man, Scott, you're just way beyond me in any sort of tenure. Um, but that's okay. I, you know, I was at CoreOS before this, so I kind of almost could have made it to Red Hat, but that's okay. So, um, yeah. so but welcome everybody. Um, like we usually start. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, please do use chat, and um, and uh, you know we'll, we'll come back to this. Uh, but but let's just let's start the comp. Not thank you. We're not we're not done yet. So I'm gonna stop sharing so that it's that it's us on here. So. Um, so Scott, your 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 title is principal product manager of containers. So. When you have to describe what a container is to somebody, you know, and let's just say it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the most highest level, what is it? Yeah, so it depends on who I'm talking to. For this audience, I'd say it's probably more technical audience. So I describe yeah. it as even the simple technical definition I'd say is, is it's two things. There's, there's a runtime component and then there's an at rest component. So I jokingly say that like containers are fancy files and they're fancy processes. Right. At rest, they're just fancy files on disk. You know, they're tar balls that have some metadata wrapped around them that you know are defined by the Open Containers Initiative. And then at runtime, um, you know, they're just fancy processes that have extra controls in place constraining them. Um, right. And so I, I often say, like, you know, I, I wrote a, a, a before before Red Hat acquired CoreOS, you know. A, I, I wrote an article that took a spin on their CEO's article about, you know, like what, what can you run databases in, in, you know, and there, he asked all these different questions that he gets that are kind of, I don't want to say he said they're dumb, but they're, they're, we get all these questions that are remedial. They're like, can I run a database in, in a, in a container? And I'm like, replace the word container with process and then ask that question again. Right. Like, exactly. Can I run a database with a process? And you're like, well, I don't know any other way that you can run a, a database. So like these, these, if you use the right mindset, you know, these questions are pretty easy to solve themselves, you know, answer right. themselves. But uh, so I joke, they're just fancy files and fancy processes. And that's then there's right. one other component. There's a registry server. It's just a fancy file server. And other than that, that's it. Fancy files, fancy processes, fancy file servers. Yeah. I mean, nothing, nothing really new. I mean, I guess it's just, I mean, namespaces have been around for a long time here, y'all. So like, you know, this is just something if anybody understands, yeah. you know, Linux, it's a pretty easy kind of transition to do this. So, you know, but Scott, if I think about containers and your your title, right, is principal product manager for containers. And I know there's a container platform and Kubernetes engine and there's OpenShift. Is there anything to innovate in containers or are they just kind of, are we at, are we at steady state and basically, you know, uh, you know, the OCI has defined this and, you know, Docker did a great job of pushing everything. You know, are we at steady state with containers? Well, so for me, no. I mean, it's funny because like my day in and day, I'll admit I'm down in the engine room. I jokingly say, you know, most of the time, these are things that like a CIO won't understand what we're doing. They have to just kind of trust that we're constantly adding new features and making it better, but they don't really necessarily understand what that is. Um, then, nor should they need to. That's kind of why you buy something like OpenShift. But that said, no, my, my days are fairly intense. Um, you know, we're always, I mean, there's a, there's a ton of features that we're still adding in cryo and podman in particular, like, yeah. you know, I'll give you an example of like what we're working on right now is image mounts. So something Docker never thought about is, and, and nor should they have needed to, I mean, it was just, it was new, but you're like, Oh, I want to fire up one container and then I want to modify another container with that. So can I bind mount in this container and then like scan it, analyze it, or maybe even modify it. And so, we're, we have these two features that we're kind of working on in Podman called overlay mounts and then also image mounts. And so you can imagine this is the flour and sugar and eggs and water of bake, you know, the cake that is containers. Yeah. If, you, if, you like, if you really look at the way a container works, it's just a bunch of overlay file system layers. And you know, the, all of them are read only except for the top one and the top one you write to. And then when you save the container, you just add one more layer. It's actually not nearly as complex as people think. Um, and I have diagrams and graphs. I go into these container internals labs. If you have Google 
container internals labs, you'll find all kinds of deep dive information I give. But in a nutshell, once you learn that that's kind of how containers work, you realize you can kind of do it inside of a container as well. So like we're looking at like, how can we bind mount a container image into a running image, you know, into a running container. And then like maybe you do a read, you know, a read write layer that's like a temp FS. And then when this container goes away, this one goes away too, but we can scan it and add things. And, you know, there's yeah. all these like basic use cases where you want two containers to be able to talk to each other in a, like a really deep way through like a POSIX file system, yeah. you know, essentially. And yeah. so like, that's like one of the things we're doing right now. Um, we need this for like, for example, Anchor and, and Twist Lock and AquaSec and all these security scanners. They want a way yeah. to like bind mount in an image, analyze it read only so you can't muck it up but but you know but know what's going on in it and then save all that data back to a database somewhere that's like the perfect use case for that yeah so and I those think kinds of features we do all yeah. the time and i think it's just kind of one of those things i mean as we become much more mature for with distributed systems i mean look at it really who was this doing distributed systems five years ago okay like really a handful maybe of companies and and, and some of them probably weren't doing it very well uh you know, you walk around KubeCon today and wow, there's a lot of people interested in this stuff and actually pushing the bounds of these things. And, you know, I think Polvi and, and what the what the team did at CoreOS to actually help drive some of these core initiatives of, you know, like, you know, they had Rocket, which was their container runtime. And I know, you know, there's been, you know, competing versions of this, but like to think of what an operating system looks needs to look like in a container. I, I think, you know, that to me, that's what's the, the, to me, that's the, that's the interesting piece, right? Like, you know, what, what, it, you know, you like, yeah, these things are going to run on an operating system. People don't realize like in that container is a, an OS, right? <laughs> and, like, yeah, OS. Yeah. Let's shrink the size of your container. Right. And so I presume like just that, that like Linux level of expertise is kind of where you're living. Right. Scott. Yeah, it is. And it's weird. Cause there's like sort of two competing narratives. One narrative is the OS doesn't matter anymore. But then when you dig into the covers, you're like, wait a minute, actually, like it matters more in a lot of yeah. ways than it ever has, you know? And so that's a strange part. You go, how did CoreOS get sold for $250 million if the OS doesn't matter? You know, like, and how did Red Hat get sold for 34 billion if the OS doesn't matter? You know, like right. there's, there's definitely two competing narratives depending on where, what your interests are and goals and, you know, desires are in the universe. Yeah. I mean, the OS always matters. I don't care yeah. what anybody says. Even with functions as a service, I don't see how it doesn't yeah, matter. Right? Like, I mean, you know, like, it's still going to matter. Yeah, like really serverless, it's still servers and there's still an OS running on those things. And I tell you what, there's a whole lot of optimizations that happen that have to happen at that layer to actually make serverless a reality, in my yep. opinion. I, I think we are only scratching the surface of what that world is gonna be. And you know, what is a truly serverless environment? To me, it ends up being something Kubernetes like, if you will, if you will almost Scott, where it's you know, you are, you know, communicating at that layer um, for, yeah. for all those things to happen, right? So yeah, absolutely. And then, yes, yeah, so there's sort of two sides of my world. There's the container images side and the container host side. There's kind of the two right. main things that we're going to, the container images side, we're always looking at things like serverless and uh, distro list and things like that. And like I, both of these words bother me, like serverless and distro list. They're neither, neither of them are actually without servers or without distros. Like just because you don't put a package manager in a container image, it does not mean that there's not a cadre of human beings going out that are subject matter experts in all these different pieces of software and packaging them in a way that is right. consumable. Like that's still the same business requirement, even if you don't use RPMs or maybe you don't use a man, you know, manager, but somebody has to still go do that work well, for yeah. you. And you need to be able to consume it easily. Is, serverless is just somebody else's servers. Isn't that what they, that's yeah. what the cloud is, right? It's just somebody else's servers, right? Like ultimately, so, uh, and there is yeah. a lot- And I joke, distroless, it's just somebody else's distro. You Even if you look at like the Google serverless stuff, a lot of the different build languages rely on Debian packages. Yeah, they don't include the package manager, and you can't rebuild them, but they're still pulling from that dependency tree. Right. So it's like dependency trees still matter even in 2020. You know. Yeah. So so let's. What other thing that's related to this? And and you know, I I think some people who are newer to containers or aren't familiar with kind of the complexity of you know you and I talked a little bit before this about the supply chain and and how do we get applications to production? You know, there's also things like Ansible or you know like you know the core S we had Quay right. Um, you know, can you just describe to me what what those tools play like uh, in, in this whole kind of supply chain? Because I think they're actually pretty important for people to understand, right? Because deploying is not easy. Yeah, absolutely. So this is probably a good segue into describing what OpenShift four is versus three. Okay. Um, so so you know historically, like if you look at OpenShift three, we used Ansible. We basically had a Kubernetes distribution, OpenShift. 
we had Ansible deploying that Kubernetes distribution on RHEL, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is a Linux distro. And so you kind of you can kind of understand all the primitives there, right? You're like, oh, it's a configuration management system, a Kubernetes distro, Linux distro, and you kind of wire it all together. You do upgrades, you know, like that's pretty easy to understand. That's probably how the whole world did things. You know, you go back to 2005, I was using a homegrown CF engine that we had written at American Greetings doing e-cards, you know, and uh, I left there in 2005. Uh, but, but you know, I called that Web 1.0. That was the tail end of Web 1.0. Um, e-cards were still making more money than you think even in 2005. But, uh, sure. but um, you know, we did do distributed systems with CF engine, right? Like we were doing with a CF engine equivalent, you know, that we were basically pushing out to a thousand Linux web servers. Um, the business problem there is the same, right? It's running 75 different services across a thousand different nodes. And we, if you look at OpenShift 3, we're kind of doing that the same as we'd always done, except that we were deploying the Kubernetes distro. So like you had one workload that you needed to deploy to all these with a config management system. And then all the other workloads where the application workloads were deployed with Kubernetes YAML. You know, you could think you'd hit that Kube API and deploy all of your stuff there. But then when you go to OpenShift 4, we actually kind of extended the API down a layer to the cluster itself. So I don't, we, I'll admit, I don't think we even Red Hat have done a good job of explaining what OpenShift 4 is, but it is a profoundly different way of thinking about Kubernetes. It's you treat the cluster itself as you treat every object in the cluster, including the nodes as objects in the Kubernetes cluster. So like, it's essentially extending that, that, you know, wait, let me back up and say, Config management works on the concept of like, you know, defined outcome, right? Like I want this thing to have user added or whatever, like right. you know, make it, um, you know, I'd component, but do it, don't do it 20 times, but add it, make sure it's there. You know, Kubernetes works on a very different paradigm where it's like defined state, actual state. And it's constantly, it's got a timer going, you know, a controller right. that's basically constantly looking for, looking at the defined state, looking at the actual state, comparing the two and trying to like make them look the same. Right. So that's a very different paradigm because, you know, Config management might run on a deploy and then maybe maybe if you were super brave, you'd run it once a day or once an hour or something like that. Kubernetes is doing it all the time, like all the time at any given, you know, that, you know, times per second, you know, or minute, you know, it's looking at the state. Managing the cluster itself as part of that defined state is what OpenShift 4 does. So you manage the nodes, you manage the container engine, you manage everything. So if you look, there's this thing called the master uh, or the, the MCO is what we call it. And it basically is an operator. And an operator is basically just an extension of Kubernetes that takes that defined state, actual state, and applies it to other things, right? And so we're basically taking this MCO and applying it to the node and the container engine that's running on that node, which are the kind of two main things you need to configure on a, on a you know, historically we did that with Ansible, but now we're moving it into the cluster. Right. So now right. there's a single API. You literally hit the Kubernetes API uh, this REST API, and you can manage everything from the node to the engine to the containers that are running on it to the state of config files on the cluster. Uh, you're treating the cluster as a single computer now through a single API endpoint. Um, right. And so that changes. Those two paradigms are very, very different. So then that changes, not to be super complex, but you're, to answer your question, what roles do these things play? They're different in each of those worlds. That's right. That's right. And I think it all it all collectively kind of comes out as OpenShift. And the value in OpenShift is this greater simplification, this abstraction up away from Kubernetes, basically, and and you know these kind of crazy configurations. And you know, I don't I don't like to write YAML. I think I find it to be you know, look at I avoided COBOL early on in my life. I don't like to count spaces. Um, you know, so like I think it's kind of one of these things that I you know why deal with any of that? I don't, you know, I want command line, but I don't, you know, maybe I, maybe a bit of a UI to manage and, and to, to do all these different things. But, you know, for me, you know, what y'all doing with OpenShift is, is truly tremendous and it's all in open, right? I mean, it's all open source, right? And so there's kind of this boundary though, between Kubernetes and what Red Hat is doing in OpenShift, right? And it's a very tightly integrated kind of, you know, platform of what's happening here. How do you guys choose what happens in, say, the Kubernetes community, and you know the stuff that Clayton and that whole team is driving and coding away on, and then what the OpenShift is seeing? And you're a product manager, so you kind of sit between the two sides, right? And so, how does that work internally with you all? So this is this is actually touches on I I, I don't know if I shared I shared the link I don't know if people that 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 join can see it in the chat or not, but uh, I'll, I'll this touches it out on this concept of open source as a supply chain. So yeah. I think there are fundamentally two ways that people look at open source. You know, there's sort of the, let's go 
three. There's three ways. There's companies that look at technology as a closed core, you know, and, and I'm borrowing, uh, you know, acquaintance of mine's of terminology very specifically there. Uh, you know, Joseph Jacks calls it closed core. You know, it's a it's the idea that we're going to build everything proprietary and we're going to deliver all value to the customer through this proprietary means, right? Then there's debate about what does open core mean? I'll, I'll fully admit there's an open debate about what does that mean, right? Red Hat is at the other end of that spectrum where essentially the vast, 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 you know, 99.9% .9 of our supply chain yeah. is open source. I, I leave room for, you know, a, a, a long tail there of there's little pieces of glue code and things that exist in our environment, like our build systems. And, you know, there's things behind the scenes that aren't necessarily public, but it's not because we don't, you know, it's not, it's not, you don't need them to run OpenShift at runtime or anything. It's just, you need some glue code here and there to make your specific environment work. Um, you know, so, so I'd say this becomes a supply chain choice, right? Like, like if you look at, if you look at OpenShift, it's made up of basically there's sort of two major pieces of the supply chain. Well, actually I'll say there's, there's Kubernetes is a huge chunk of the supply chain yeah. for it. I would say that's like the motor, mm -hmm. right? Like in a car, let's, let's make a car comparison. The motor is Kubernetes. Like you need an electric motor or a gasoline or a diesel motor. You have to decide this. If you're a product manager, like you have to decide which motor meets the needs of my customer, right? You go, right. you go, my customer wants to pull trailers. So maybe we only have diesel and electric as an option. You know, maybe gas isn't good enough. Um, these are the kinds of decisions that the PM makes, right? And so then you look at OpenShift, I'd say Kubernetes is the motor. And then you look at all the things that run on top of Kubernetes. Um, you know, well, first let's start with what's below it. Red Hat Core OS, below it. That is, you know, you look at the supply chain, it's Fedora, then RHEL. And RHEL Core OS is basically just a different snapshotted version of the exact same bits are in RHEL. So the supply chain is Linux, you know, is the motor for that. And there's a whole bunch of thousands of other projects around it, you know, for the door handles and everything else. And then you come down into a distribution like Fedora, then down into RHEL and RHEL Core OS. So you can could, you could start to imagine in your mind a map of like this crazy deep web of, you know, all these different projects that go into OpenShift. So the supply chain for OpenShift is basically Kubernetes, Linux upstream, you know, the major motors. And then downstream, you go to OKD. OKD is sort of, a, a again, an open source, freely usable. You don't have to pay a subscription to use it. You know, sort of interim project. Think of it as almost like a distro, kind of like Fedora, where it brings it all together. And then, and then there's OpenShift. So how do we decide what goes where? You know, like, that's the biggest question, right? Yeah. Basically, if the Kubernetes, it, Kubernetes, you know, I, this is where I try to talk about in my article about, like, what is open source product management? Like, your upstream supplier should do something different than what you do. Like if your upstream supplier sells fuel injectors and you sell fuel injectors, you're going to have a problem. Like, like right. you guys are never going to be able to differentiate each other and you're never going to be able to make money. If right. the upstream supplier sells a fuel injector and you sell a car, it's a lot easier to differentiate. So yeah. you have to look at the use case, right? Like the use case for OpenShift is it's a, I always joke, it's a, it's a 200, you know, it's a, it's a dump truck that can go 200 miles an hour and it carries 10 tons of dirt. That's not something that everybody needs, but if you need a dump truck that goes 200 miles an hour and handles pretty well and carries 10 tons of dirt, that's an interesting use case, right? Like it's a, it's an advanced use case that basically people that don't want to have to manage that entire supply chain themselves handle. And so we decide based on what the need of the user is essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's, let's, let's abstract that exact point up, Scott. And so, you know, yes, there's the internal workings of the car and like fuel injectors and the engine and the drivetrain and the you know, the chassis and all these things. And and yeah. and I think those things are important. And I think what OpenShift is doing is pulling all that together. So you get a car. Yeah, like you, exactly. You get it, or, or I'm sorry, in this case, a pickup truck, right? And so, yeah. you know, what, what you know, if I was to just, you know, I'm new to these things, like, you know, you, you, say, you say it's a pickup truck, you know, how do I work this into my, you know, my my architecture today, right? As, a, as an enterprise organization, like this abstracted up to a wholly other layer. And, and what am I using it for? Like, what's the value I'm getting out of OpenShift and Kubernetes, it, you know, for, for at that layer, right? Like without getting too deep into the weeds, like, you know, what are the workloads people are using? We'll come to that as, as the next thing, but like, what, what is it? What's, why do I want to buy this thing ultimately? Yeah, exactly. It's, well, and so to be fair, it's not that the workloads are necessarily different, although they can be, um, you know, the user of OpenShift wants something that just works out of the box and will upgrade for, right. you know, 10 years, you know, whatever, seven years, you know, in a row, like you're not going to get that value out of the upstream, right? Like if you're upgrading Kubernetes every six months, you're going to have a lot of work on your hands. The bottom yes. line is that's just a lot of work for you to do. And that costs money that costs engineers and engineers are hard to hire. And so 
it, it's pretty natural where the, the fit is, right? Like we want to make the experience of life cycle, FIPS compliance, security, you know, so government organizations, big, you know, large enough enterprises that they, they would try to tackle this themselves and realize that they don't want to do it because it, it costs a lot of money and it's, these are very hard engineers to get a hold of. Um, you know, I'd say it's, it's more based on like a business understanding of like, do I really want to tackle all this myself, right? Yeah. Like do, do I want to buy a bucket of parts and build a dump truck or do I just want to buy a dump truck Take it to you know Ford and have them service it. Right, and and you know, I think like, and I think that's one of the things that people struggle with with Kubernetes. Right, there's a lot of pieces. It's complex. I have to deal with storage and networking and security and all these different things. And and I think what what OpenShift does is simplify a lot of that for the end. It's a pre-built and, solution. And you know exactly. yeah exactly. And like having a package solution around those things. And we used to do this with with Hadoop. I mean. Could somebody roll their own Hadoop distribution eight years ago, sure. whatever that? Yeah, sure, you bet. Like, why would you do that, right? And then you need indemnification, all these things. And I think yep, exactly. you know, intelligent companies like like Red Hat does it. You know, I think one of the other areas that that you know you you just touched on very clearly, and, and people are asking, you know, like why why is this important? You know, back at CoreOS, this whole concept of Tectonic was how do we do rolling upgrades and how do we automate upgrades of software, right? And so there you go. You know, and upgrades I is probably a, one of the biggest challenges of Kubernetes. That's right. Yeah, I mean, because each pod has to be updated, and there's different layers of, that have to be updated in each pod, right? And then the control plane itself needs to be updated, right? And I think that's one of those core benefits. And you know, talking about the operational complexity of Kubernetes, well, just understanding the damn thing took me a while to figure out, right? Like running it in production is it's difficult, and I think that's where the value for you know, I, I, that, you know, that to me, Scott, that's, you know, then again, I'm not the product manager. See, I'm product marketing. See, this is how we work together, buddy. Well, and so the funny part is you're like, you would never, you would never find a business in the fortune 2000, the Russell 3000 or 2000 that would build their own Linux distro. Right. I mean, maybe in, in if their, if their business is like, you know, embedded systems where they're doing some very, very specific thing, but you're not going to find anybody doing you know, building their own Linux distro to run SAP on it, right? Like that just doesn't even make any sense whatsoever. And I think it's a little bit easier to see with a technology that's a little bit older and more mature because you, you start to realize you're like, oh yeah. I mean, again, like the perfect car for a family would be like mom and dad build the car specifically for the family with the exact right. size seats for every family member's butt. And you know, like the exact safety require. nobody does that. That's irrational and like, and not, that's not efficient, right? And so the market provides sort of an approximate solution that's pretty good, that's worth paying for. Essentially, like right. mom and dad would rather buy a minivan than go build a minivan that's perfect for their family. Like this is so obvious with cars. It's so obvious with Linux, but it, it's still not completely obvious with Kubernetes because it's new and people look at it and they go, they go, oh, this is strategic to our business. So we want to build it and then add all these things to it and then maintain over time. And like one to three years into that, they go, yeah, this was not necessarily what we actually wanted to do. Like well, we would actually be better if we were building stuff on top of Kubernetes that actually met our business needs as opposed to building Kubernetes, right? Right, like, exactly. Just, and I think that's where people are struggling right now. They get too deep in the reeds, right? I mean, Tim, you, yeah. you see people out there using Kubernetes all the time, right? And so, you know, what are the workloads you're seeing kind of people shift into Kubernetes? Is it all of them or is it, you know, and, and what's that journey look like for them? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, I, I think the Kubernetes still for the, the folks that we talk to is is a bit aspirational. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, it's on everybody's roadmap and certainly those who are, are, are doing it are doing it at the app layer. So, you know, it, customers are certainly talking about, well, I, you know, I'm moving my application workloads, you know, my microservices to... <laughs> To Kubernetes uh, type architectures, but obviously here at Cockroach Labs, what are we selling? You know, we're selling the database, and and we want to um, want to and can run Cockroach DB on Kubernetes. And so, you know, right. we're starting to have the conversation of people not only not only using Kubernetes to deploy application servers, but to start to deploy you know a storage layer. And so, that that kind of really at times makes people's head kind of explode. Yeah. Well, what do you mean I can run a database? You know, as we were talking about in containers. Well, sure, of course. Yeah, I can run a database in Kubernetes. Absolutely, uh, for all the same reasons that you'd want to run it, uh, your application in Kubernetes. You know. Yeah. And so, but yeah, we're still, and not everybody's there yet, but they're getting there. They're yeah. definitely getting there. And I think it, I think it's it's one of these things. That it, it, we're going through a paradigm shift. Like, literally, it's going to take all of us time. And and you know, Scott, you're in it, right? Like you're, you're like when you're deep in it, you're you're just there. 
Whereas like, if there's a mass majority of people who just don't understand like, like what does, what, what is the, the, the result of distributed system for you and, and what we're trying to do and, and the complications. I, let me, let me shift a little bit into the data and, and you know, what that actually means in these systems. You know, the first time I ever saw CockroachDB and here I am now at this company a few years later, uh, Paul V from uh, CoreOS was up on, uh, Brian, I forget his last name, the guy who runs OpenStack. I forget, I forget the guy's name. He was like the president of the OpenStack consortium or whatever, I forget what it was, Scott. But we were at OpenStack Summit. Yeah, they were at OpenStack Summit and they wanted to show off like Kubernetes and like how you couldn't kill this thing. And what's what was the distributed application? Well, it was the database, like, holy cow, like I can have this distributed database, right? And so I think we're seeing people think about Kubernetes, you know, when it first came out, people were like, oh, it's for stateless workloads. What is that? I don't even know what that means, you know what I mean? Are you still hearing a lot of those same kind of concerns from customers, Scott? Like, where am I using this thing? How am I going to use it? Like, that's great. I, I, I trust you, Red Hat. And like this OpenShift thing is awesome. I'm sold. Are, are, are customers struggling with like the workloads and, and how, to, how to instrument and how to make it all happen? I, I presume that's one of the reasons why OpenShift is here in the marketplace and all that, right? So it's absolutely. So, so one, of the, one of the most popular talks I've given over the last five, six years has been my migration talks like like if you look every generation we've went from like bare metal to virtual machine i mean we can go back as far as you want mainframes to mini computers to unix boxes to linux to virtual machines but but there's always been three options right there's lift and shift like can i just take this thing i have and run it on this new thing and does it give yep. me some benefit right and then there's like augment you're like well we'll move part of it and then we'll add some things to it to like That's maybe right. make it work better and then there's a let's just write all this crap from scratch and obviously it gets more expensive. You know, you go from lift and shift is the cheapest to like rewrite everything. The CIO does not want to hear that you're rewriting everything. So this is constantly like, there's always going to be a business challenge here, right? And so, yeah, absolutely. My not one of my number one conversations is all, what can we put in OpenShift and what will work well? Right, and exactly. What do we run on RHEL and what will work well there? And what should we just leave alone because it's not worth moving in? And these are like, yeah, absolutely. And they're they're really complex questions depending on the environment that require, you know, a lot of times it, in, it results in consulting, going in and analyzing, you know, a whole, a whole portfolio of applications right, and, looking yep. at them and, all. and you're like, these 32 run here, these 72 run there, you know, and it, it's not an easy question to answer, but at a minimum, I mean, I, the thing I try to guide people is that if you could separate the code, the configuration and the data, like whatever that means, like with MySQL, you can separate the code configuration and data, but the problem is the data is a, is one thing unless you're using galera or using something like cockroach you know like if you have a single piece of data that's like one chunk that's you know uh uh a, a uh you know i don't you can't it's not it's not distributed you know set up to be distributed essentially to have multiple replicas and things like that if it's not cloud native which we tried to teach people with OpenStack, but i think we just rammed through that wall and just people kept going like i could run it yeah. like a virtual machine now with containers i think it's finally we're at a hard place where you if you really want to run this in kubernetes you need to build a, you need to be able to imagine a couple things. One, this thing could run anywhere because Kubernetes can decide where it can run it wherever it wants at any given moment. And then two, it might restart it a thousand times. So like you've got to be able to kind of handle two things, right? Like can move anywhere at any time and restart a thousand times. Like Apache can handle being restarted a thousand times. An Oracle database, not so much. Like, you know, like you restart an Oracle database a thousand times on a thousand different nodes. That's probably going to create a problem. Good luck. You know, so something that like something like cockroach that's designed for that is going to handle right. that a lot better than something that's not designed to do that. Oh no. And I think it comes back to like the core principles of distributed systems, right? Like build it as a small single atomic unit. So it can deploy the same way everywhere. Right. Um, they're, they're, they're built for scale so that you can easily scale them. So they communicate in that way. Um, they will survive at all times. Right. And I think those, are, those core principles come back. You, you mentioned something that Scott, which I found kind of interesting. You know, it's like, look at, I can lift and shift. I'll take the thing VM and all dump it into a container and run it, right? I can make some small changes to it, augment, augment, and kind of like, okay, maybe it's kind of distributed at that point, you know, yeah, whatever that means. Yeah, yeah right. Or maybe exactly. we run part of it outside the cluster, part of it in the cluster. That's right, exactly. And it's yeah. like, or, or do you just re-architect from the ground up? And, you know, here at Cockroach Labs, we chose to re-architect from the ground up. And you just kind of set something off in my mind. And... And I, and I kind of realized why I joined this company is because if you're going to run a database on Kubernetes, you have to re-envision it. It's, it's not as simple as just running it, you know, mounting a persistent volume using the storage class and figuring that out. You, you, if you try to augment or you try to lift and shift, it's not built for that world. 
right? And so, you know, we realized that with the database, is this some of these things, like if I'm a consumer of OpenShift or I'm going down the path of Kubernetes, like maybe my application is just not built for this new world. Is, is that a question that organizations should be asking themselves? Oh no yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because if you force a round peg in a square hole, it's not going to work well, and you're going to end up with more nightmares. You know, like right. I said, cram an Oracle database on 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 Kubernetes and see what happens. You know, like right. it'll work great for a few days, months, years. You know, until one day Kubernetes like runs into some problem where it can't schedule it and it restarts it 200 times, and then the database gets corrupted, and you know, you just end up with these crazy problems, right? Because it wasn't right. designed to run in a distributed way. And then I, I'm just, I, I kind of, somebody was asking a question it was like, what are the challenges of moving a database into Kubernetes? And I think that's exactly it, Scott, right? Like if, if you're going to run a legacy database, like you want to run MySQL or Postgres in, in, in a pod. Okay, great. But you need to understand that, that pod is ephemeral and it may die. And so even with stateful sets, which is a kind of a key concept in Kubernetes, if, if somebody doesn't know what it is, I, I would check out stateful sets. It's, a very interesting way of actually maintaining some sort of state when a pod dies, right? It's the the simplest explanation, right? Yeah. Um, without that, you know, it, it was it was a complete loss cause. But even with that, it's still a problem, right? Because like, it still won't hard. handle a hundred restarts. That's the pro That's the other problem I try to explain. Right. It's not just about where it lands. It's also about how many times it lands there. Right. You know, there's 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 time and space. Like I always try to explain to people, there's time and space in Kubernetes, and you have to yeah. decide like, can this thing handle being moved anywhere in the universe? A thousand times per second, you know, yeah. that's a different problem set, you know, has to be yeah. designed for that. Now there's things like Apache can handle that pretty well. You know, you're right. Like if you're, you know, maybe you have a very small website, a blog, you know, like it can probably handle that with just a MySQL database hand. But you do that sure. at scale, that's probably going to fall down. You know, that's yeah. where it starts falling down. Yeah. And, and it, it really, it, it it's choosing the right workloads to run in these environments and where it makes sense. Where are you going to get the efficiencies and why do you need that efficiency? I think is the biggest question, right? And I think that's where I've always kind of had these conversations about workloads and Kubernetes and OpenShift and all these things. It really comes back to that. Um, going back though, and just talking about applications, moving them over and this sort of thing, there's this concept of an operator, right? And a, and a Kubernetes, you know, Rob Zimsky, a friend of mine, I, I love Rob. Rob's another brilliant product Rob manager too. at at Red Hat, and, you know, and just a really solid human. Um, totally. You know, and I remember Brandon Phillips, Rob, and I having a conversation about operators. Actually, I think Brandon wanted to call them controller operators, and Rob was like controllers. I'm like, no, man, just just operators. They're like, you know, do, should be people be thinking of that? Like, is that a is that the conduit to make your app work in 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 Kubernetes? You know, or is that just basically something that you know, the software engineering teams that are building things that are going to be deployed, they should be thinking about, right? Like, you know what I mean? So like, is, is this something that's like consumer grade or is it more like, you know, the, the industrial grade supply chain, you know, vendors have to think about that? I think it's both. I think both groups of people have to think about it. I mean, that's, that's probably, again, one of the biggest conversations I've had over the last few years is like explaining to people what operators are. The way I've broken it down and I've, I've bumped this off Rob to see if he was cool with it, but like, you know, <laughs> If you think about traditional operating operating environments, you know, you know, operational excellence. What did it take to achieve operational excellence? You deployed an app on a server, and then you had a human being, also called a sysadmin, that would make right. sure those things, two things, work together, and that's how you achieved operational excellence, right? In this Kubernetes world, you really need a robot sysadmin called an operator. That now you deploy the app on the platform, you know, and now it's a cluster treated as a again, kind of an open shift for paradigm is that you could treat the cluster as a single computer, basically, but you're spanning across a bunch of nodes. Um, so it's the, it's the platform, the app, and then a robot sysadmin that you deploy side by side with the app that takes care of the app. So like, you know, the operator can do things like back it up, restore it, you know, check on it if it's broken. You know, I, I talk about like, if it restarts 200 times and the tables get corrupt, the operator will know what to do, right? Like yeah. the operator is what helps handle, you know, coddle these sort of, I call them cloud immigrants. They might not be cloud native, but they've immigrated into the cloud. And so, like, that's right. you know, you know, kind of coddling that, that's what the robot sysadmin slash operator does. And so the knowledge now moves from, we used to have that in a run book in a wiki. And instead of in a wiki, we now have moved it into the operator, right? Like, well, yeah. And, so and like for a while there, I mean, has to be able to do that work now. That's right. And for a while there, we moved it into the SRE's head, right? And so the SRE was basically going off and building scripts and like, you know, SRE being kind of one of these artifacts of Google and kind of their whole approach, you know, again, it's like, 
is this Giphy, which is Google infrastructure for everybody, right? Like, yeah, kind of, you know, and I think the operator was codifying. I think so too. Some of the things that the SRE was doing because, you know, doing the operating these things at scale are incredibly difficult. Like how do you actually manage certificates in a distributed environment across every pod and make sure that everything's going to be sorted out? Like, okay, Vault's going to probably solve one problem for you, but like uh, you still need to distribute and make it, you know, it, these things are complex. It's about velocity in my mind. So like if you looked at the velocity of the standard application, you could fix it once a day, once a month, once a year. You know, I had I had a server that we booted up, you know, put rel, I forget what it was, six or seven on it. And it ran, you know, it, probably five or six, sorry. And, you know, it ran for 10,000 days or whatever it ran. And then we shut it off. Like it was... It was ridiculous. It yeah. booted once and it shut down once. We never had to reboot it. Even there was never been a remotely exploitable kernel bug. So we never had to reboot it. Like this is what people don't understand. That kind of velocity is very different than the velocity of I might need to do this multiple times per second or minute, you know, like, and so when you look at, when you looked at the way config management works in a traditional environment, if you, if you're, if you're, for example, your monitoring system notices a web server goes down. Your config manager could go out. You literally could have Nagios talk to Ansible to go out and restart the web server, right? Like, like this would happen once a month, once a week. That's fine. Like that feedback loop is slow enough, and and you know it's there's enough slack. Right. It's kind of like a 1960s car. It's like you know, like the gear. You find a gear and you can feel it grab, and you're like, but that's hey, what makes it fun, man. Pretty. That's fun, right? Like you. It is it. fun. But when you're talking about inside the Kubernetes cluster, this defined state, actual state methodology is it's an OODA loop that's basically happening all the time. And so the idea is you're deploying the operator in this tight OODA loop. You're now in the reactor, right? Like it needs to be able to happen and react at the state of the Kubernetes database. So at the speed of the Kubernetes database state change, right? And so that's what that operator does. You, you deploy the automation inside the cluster and it right. has access to the state data Unlike you, you know, so historically you had a monitoring system, a fault monitoring system, a config management system, this, and then the underlying platform and all of these different disparate systems had to talk to each other and they didn't share a database. But if you deploy all this in Kubernetes, it's all saved in the etcd database. And I think in my mind, that velocity that that can achieve, you know, of restarting a container within seconds of it failing, you know, is a different right. animal than, than, than doing it, you know, oh, well, it took us two, three, four minutes to get this thing back up. Okay, no problem. Back yeah, in the that's day, right. But, yeah. You know, at scale you know, with capacity, that doesn't work. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. You talk about state and how you use that in the context of the operator. It's funny when we, you know, when I first joined Cockroach Labs, you know, I was, we got to build an operator. And I remember, you know, guys on our team that understand Kubernetes, like, what are you talking about? We don't need an operator. And actually, because we were designed as a distributed system that can actually natively, you know, survive a failure of a pod or region or whatever, like what, it, because you can do that, you don't need a lot of those kind of core operator things that, that some applications may need because you got to think about scale right? or uh, yes. resilience, right? Scale is how do you deploy and actually get all these things to work, right? And, and, or rolling upgrades, like these sort of things are not always easy to deal with. You know, how do you apply yeah, patches across that? Huge one. Yeah, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you apply patches? And I think, you know, those are the core patterns that I see in operators and, and, you know, well, well, we have an operator. I know it's, it's, uh, it, we're container certified and then our operator is now certified by Red Hat as well. I'll probably, you know, pushing out some news before KubeCon, but what the heck the people on the thing will know, right? Um, but yeah, we, we did it because, well, there's certain things, there's certain deployment patterns that actually are difficult to do and it goes beyond just being a distributed system and i think that's the kind of stuff that uh that i think people you yeah, know as you... upgrades yeah upgrades go on sorry is a perfect example yeah oh no i was gonna say you 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 really struck me when you say upgrades upgrades is probably yeah. the hardest thing again go back to traditional environment and imagine upgrading a mysql database from like i don't know a major version you know three to four whatever right. you know and you go, you go that's a lot a lot of interaction like you've got to like shut the database down back it up well, run some kind of up, you know, install the new version of the software before you do that. You know, how do you do that? Like, like which order do you do these things in? Like, like well, you have to like shut it down, export or, you know, export the database, then shut it down, then remove the software, add the new version, or maybe install them side by side. Then you've got to like run some upgrade script that changes the schema. Then you've got to like start, fire the new one up. Oh, it didn't work. Oh shit. Now, how do we get the schema and, back and to the old Scott, version to restart this? Like Scott, that's not easy. 
Scott, that's that's one instance. That's a stovepipe database. Yeah, that's one instance. Start, start yeah. talking about, you know, I have 50 containers already. And that's why you had maintenance software. windows that were eight, well, eight hours long. What, I'm going to SSH into each one of the servers and start figuring this out and do it, you know, like, you know, so like the upgrade process, applying patches, which a patch, you know, patches are so incredibly important today. You know, this, I mean, security problems are just, just massively important. So um, I wanted to but, Like you back. can imagine like, Historically, a sysadmin would go and fiddle fart with all that and figure it out. Then we got to automation where we had like an Ansible or a, or a chef or a CF engine. We could kind of codify those rules, right? But it still took, I mean, do an Ansible upgrade with something. It'd still take hours, you know, sometimes to upgrade things. Like you don't have hours, right? Like you've got to go figure all that out at the factory and then deploy it in production. Like I, joke, I jokingly say containers are about building at the factory, not at the dock, right? Like like historically, you go back to 1800s, we take all the lamps and pianos and barrels and boxes and crates and like literally on carts, you know, with horses and we take them down to the dock and load them on. And it took freaking three, four, five days. It would take months to load a ship. People don't understand this, like a month. And then we ended up getting to containers and you're like, we loaded the same amount of stuff that's just as complex because we did it at the factory where it was air sealed and clean. That's right. And we, and we did it in salt water with open air, like just put it on there, turn some twist ties, lock the thing down. Like, right. that's the idea of an operator. Like, the operator is able to, like, handle just these final last mile operations with access to the state data of what's going on in the entire system at the same time. But since you have that unified state data, it's like a robot sysadmin that has access to the, it's that's like right. if I hooked my brain into, like, you know, a distributed system and be like, oh, I can feel the state of all the things, you know, it's the matrix, right? And you didn't have that kind of power with a regular configuration management system, but you do with an operator. Because right. it, can, and it can check all these things in real time and figure out what's going on. Right. And honestly, it was a, you know, I, if I think back about a couple of years ago, it, it wasn't that Kubernetes couldn't do this. It's just that Kubernetes is its own layer and it has to do what it does, which is basically let me manage state. Ultimately, Kubernetes is one thing. It, it, yeah. it listens to that CD and says, I need to have, this is the state that I need. Like, that's it. Like, literally... If you're going to break it down in the most simple thing, etcd is just exactly. a very it all it does is database that says, here's my state. And as you said, Scott, I need to make sure that the state looks like this. It means five instances of this, six instances of that, 120 instances of this piece. And, and uh, it, that's all it does. It's really yep. all it does ultimately in the end, right? Like, yep. There's a lot of complexity and there's networking and storage and all these things that have to happen, right? It but, handles defining the state really well. Right. It does yeah, not handle the state changing the state. Right, exactly. And, when, and when there's things that you got to do in between the state change. That's right. Like, that's right. Like, and I yeah. think, you know, if, if people think about operators and like where they fit, that's how they fit. There's the thing that's basically controlling and making it out. You know, it, it is the, the, the Uber robot. And then you got a robot controlling the robot. Right. I like, I like it. It's robot SRE is what this is. So that's what it is. It's a robot SRE. And then OpenShift 4 is basically about having robot SREs for both the applications, which is what regular operators do. And then we've right. also written system operators that manage the host and the engine and then all the other software that runs in OpenShift. So, so, let me, so let like, me, it's actually quite simple once you really- Let, let me do my job and, and make my, my robot overlords happy as well. Um, let's talk about the Red Hat Marketplace and, um, and what you guys are doing there. And I think you know, people are asking a lot of questions about like complexity of applications and it, are we just basically building things because engineers have free cycles or, you know, like what, what is the value of the marketplace? And, you know, we're, we're, we are definitely in the marketplace and we're seeing, you know, adoption through there. Like what, what is the vision and, and, and what's going on with OpenShift from that point of view? So in my opinion, the marketplace is like the final culmination of what we've wanted for 20 years. Like if you go back when I first started doing this, like 98, you know, I, I did, there wasn't really a concept of cloud, but automation was already like, even in 2000, 2001, we knew what automation, Unix sysadmins knew what automation was. Right. Right. But the problem was, is everybody built automation for their specific environment everywhere. Right. Like, and so if you really think about, if you had a thousand different companies building automation, there was a thousand different automations they were building. And so it was a thousand times the amount of work that you need to do. Yeah. And then I would say by like 2005 to 10, even not, you know, 11, 12, we had OpenStack and we started to see the writing on the wall. They're like, wait a minute, I can interact with the API and then I've got to build the automation once and I can deploy the automation at the thousand sites, but write it once. And, you know, we could see it, but, but it didn't quite go to the point where you could like select the automation that you want and deploy. There was still a baker in the, you know, there was a chef in the kitchen that was still choosing the ingredients and figuring out how to, how to make the food. 
but there wasn't a menu, right? Like there was no menu. You couldn't just order. It was like more like right. cooking at your house. And I saw a lot of projects fail because I was actually a solutions architect at the time for Red Hat. And I remember I had one customer in particular. They had this wildly ambitious plan to use ServiceNow and like all this crazy homegrown automation with like Ansible and Chef and Puppet or whatever they were using. And, uh, you know, they had like all the moving parts of what's in the marketplace today, but there was no standard way to do the automation. Like it was still an open system that didn't have constraints placed on it. And I'd argue now for the first time since we've standardized on Kubernetes, we've kind of standardized on this operator framework, which really is a framework of like how you do the automation. You now have the ability to standardize a marketplace. Like this is like options trading. Like options are standardized. You know, there's a set price and a set date. And so you can trade them in Chicago. Like you can trade Chicago. Nobody knew that in like 1776. Nobody was like, oh, we'll just trade these options. I'll, I'll buy something at a future time. Like we realize that if you set the standards, you can actually trade these things on the market. That's, That's right. what we finally done. We finally figured out how to get software into a market and trade it essentially for dollars, you know, right. at, because all the automation is standard. And so now, you know, if you go there and you look at Cockroach GB, you click on a button, it'll install. And you know it will install because it was built on specific versions of OpenShift. And so like, right. you know that will work. Like, you know, that's, that's, we're really close to the dream, you know, if you will, the dream yeah. state. We're finally to the electricity where you just buy the electricity and it actually works. That's right. That's right. And I think it's just taken time. You know, I've, I've, you know, I've contended yeah. over the past five to 10 years. What we've done is we've basically abstracted out all the components of the software delivery supply chain from from the fingertips of the of the developer all the way through to the the mouse click of the user and and everything that has to happen in between we finally have codified that into its finally. constituent parts and it's all api based so that you know that entire supply chain just as we've done in the past with with a physical supply chain like a wool jacket that you're talking about right like you're you're you know like the time it takes and all the components from the raw materials uh, to 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 packaging to, to getting it in the store, putting a price and a skew and all that. We yeah. basically created a, a, a very well greased automated supply chain for software. And I think Kubernetes is just basically now expanding that to, to, to even deeper depths of, of, of global, uh, you know, deployments. And I think doing that has, has made huge changes and it, it wouldn't have been done without, you know, the likes of the companies like the chefs and then, the, and, the, and puppet and like, those were huge, massive stats. Everybody that, you know, like the Cloud Bees team and what they're doing in CI CD, huge piece of this, right? Like I think about Launch Darkly and what they're doing with feature flagging. Like how cool is that that we have that in the supply chain? I feel like OpenShift, Scott, is is the culmination of a lot of those things. It, it, it's 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 Ford versus, you know, the one-off car, right? Like, I mean, it's kind of the, you know, that that's where we're headed, right? It's like the the full like end-to-end -end production facility, correct? Yeah, I, I, I liken it to like Swatch. People don't know, but in 2010-ish, they created the first automatic watch that was touchless yeah. from from the plastic to the time it rolled off the assembly line and you literally put it put it in a box and everything and you just went in the truck and it went to the store. There was right. historically for like 500 years we've been making watches or whatever it is, there always had to be a watchmaker. The closest they'd gotten it like in the 2000s was having a watchmaker fine tune it at the very end and they'd... Right. they'd but they figured out a laser way to do it now that it's like completely touchless manufacturing. What we've done is that touchless manufacturing, but like we've, instead of just for one company, for one product line, we've done it for an ecosystem of products. That's right. You know, That's it's right. like now Cockroach TV and even your competitors and your friends and allies and all these different like pieces of software, they can all build on the same, the same essentially assembly line that basically allows them to have this touchless manufacturing. And the trick is, you know, it's all going to end up in different stores and in different countries and all these different things. So let me, I'll ask you a bit of a directive question. I'm a, I'm a believer in this thing, but you know, do we live in a multi-cloud world? Is that basically the future? I think there's some people who say like, no way, it's never going to happen. Like it's too complex. Like, I'm a believer in it personally. What, what what's your opinion? I think on we already have it, oh, Scott. Uh, here's what nobody realizes: just like the cloud, you remember the narrative seven years ago when we were like, "You're already using Amazon and you don't know it." Yeah, right. Well, you're already using Azure and Amazon and you don't know it. Like yeah. the CIO doesn't know, but he has developers in his group doing this thing and developers in another group. And I've seen I've seen CIOs do stuff as crazy as not a lot, like literally working with a credit card company to limit where people spend money because you know they right. can't get a handle on it. They can't control where everybody's going. I would say 
I don't know, 80% of the Fortune 500s probably already have multi-cloud and they don't know. Yeah. Well, like, and so now it's going to be, it's going to be like, well, I'm not, you know, five years from now when we finally realize and wake up, oh, we actually are using, wait, we're using how many, seven different clouds? What, what are we, let's figure out how to make all this stuff work together, right? Like, like, right. you know, like we definitely need to be able to get a handle on this and then control the costs and blah, blah, blah. Wow, man, I asked the right question. You just almost threw your microphone right off the table, dude. I mean, like, Scott. I'm passionate about this one. I, I'm, I'm super passionate about this one. In fact, you know, we created a multi-cloud conference last year called Escape. And I know, you know, the Red Hat team was extremely supportive of it because I think they're sharing the vision. I, you know, I personally, you know, my, you look at, I've been an open source person for a while and, you know, Jim Whitehurst and Paul Cormier, you know, the leaders of Red Hat have done such a phenomenal job actually understanding that the world is not homogenous, right? The, the world is heterogeneity and, and it's always going to be that way. And by the way, the world is also open. And, and I think that's yeah, the, exactly. And I think that's, that's a lot of the trick and you know i you know i commend you guys all all y'all at, at red hat like i think the the delivery of OpenShift and what i'm seeing in OpenShift for and you know i'm sorry but i'm i'm an old core os person so i got you know i bleed right like the tectonic thing was, was very near and dear too, i mean there's so much of it, it is in that. it really is and and it, and it's just really really proud to see this really coming to light and and you know to see the marketplace and it's in its reality and you know, looking back to, you know, to my conversation with Brandon Phillips a long time ago, like, oh, man, it'd be great because we would just push button and deploy, you know, and, and, and by the way, not even worry about upgrades because that's just all automated in the background. Yep. Like to me that the- It's the app store of, of, it, of B2B apps now. That's right. As opposed to just a B2C app on your phone. That's right. That's right. And, and, you know, kudos to the team um, and, and, um, and everything that's been going on, but um, we're at the top of the hour. Um, Scott, thank you so much. Um, that was a great conversation. Uh, I had a hard time getting a word in edgewise, but that's good. It's, it was really good. Sorry, Tim, I'm you sorry. know, like, Hey, <laughs> I can just as easily be quiet on these things. No, I no, like it too. It was great. It was awesome. Yeah, it was so super, thank you. Yeah. It's super insightful. So, um, but seriously, thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us, Scott. It was really, really a lot of fun. Say hey to, to Rob for me over there. Um, I will. And thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Alrighty, um, and everybody, yeah, recording this will be available. Um, there are no slides for you to send, um, but I hope it was useful for everybody. Um, if you did, I know, uh, I think, I believe we, we still send out a survey. So please do fill out the survey. Let us know how we did. Um, we're always trying to improve these things as always. It's, it's constant, constant involvement. Um, so for, on behalf of three guys with flannel shirts, um, thank you everybody for joining us today. And one guy didn't wear a hat. He didn't get the memo. It's cool though, so. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us and, and I hope you have a enjoyable rest of the day. Bye now.